I'm speaking with Larry Johnson, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the New Medium Consortium. Larry, what does NMC really do? You know, that's a question that my mom has asked me, and so I have a little story that I tell her. We're the machete guys. We go out in the jungles of emerging technologies, and we hack those early trails for colleges and universities and explore where things are and what's happening there. Sometimes they lead to dead ends. Sometimes people come along behind us and build trails and roads, and we, but we're not road builders. We don't build trails. We're the machete guys. We're See? out there exploring the early technologies and doing demonstration projects. Do you mean you're trail blazers? Uh, no, we're, we're trail makers. You know, we, uh, we do study emerging technology as, uh, as a core function of, of our operation. It's something that's, that's very important to us to understand where all that's going. And so we engage in processes to understand that year-round all the time. But uh, we don't actually invest ourselves in any of the technologies. We're not, we're not interested so much in the technologies themselves as we're interested in how they can be applied to teaching or learning or research, which are the missions of a university. So how does this relate to collective intelligence? Well, the way that we share our, the information um, that we learn is really a, a very much a dynamic process, and that's where the collective intelligence comes in. So it's not all us sharing with the colleges and universities about what we've learned. It's also them sharing back with us and us feeding that into the loop and having sort of a dynamic process where not only are we contributing but others are contributing. Our role is to kind of um, monitor the gas on the stove and ensure that the bubbles keep, keep coming up in the pot. And what's the ultimate objective of all this? The ultimate objective of it all is to ensure that our colleges and universities, and, and I mean this globally, and when I say our, I, mean, I really have a global perspective on this, are engaged in the kinds of things that are going to keep them innovative and up-to-date and able to take advantage of, of the newest ideas. Now, are you addressing a problem? And if so, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? Well, we are addressing a problem, and the problem is stagnation. You know, if you're not actively out there trying to understand new things, then you're likely to find yourself falling into stagnation. That's what we try and do. We try and help colleges and universities stay engaged with new ideas, help them to, to engage in that easily. One of the problems that I think all of us face in, in dealing with emerging technology is a lot of times like staying in front of a fire hose. There's so much coming at us all the time, it's hard to sort through what you should pay attention to. That's what we come in and try and do. We try to answer that question. Pay attention to these things. These are the things that we've looked at collectively. And our collective wisdom, the consensus sapientum is how we describe it, helps us to understand which of them are most likely to be important. Now, you referred to collective wisdom. Earlier, we were talking about collective intelligence. Are they synonymous, or is there... No, I don't think they are. Um, and, and for us, the distinction is significant. And I think it's the same as if you would just compare the two words without the, the, the adjective, wisdom and intelligence. I mean, there is something about understanding knowledge, but then there's something that wisdom brings to that that is a little, little greater. And so we don't look for just the things that the community knows. We look for the things the community understands, and that's a subtle but important difference. Is there a feeling that humans in aggregates are more intelligent than humans as individuals? You know, that's an, that's an interesting question. It's an open um, opportunity for dialogue, I think. I think in some cases, absolutely yes. And in other cases, I think there's... Uh, well, let me put it this way. The, the collective intelligence falls into several categories, and we can get into that in a minute if you'd like to, but, but the danger of collective intelligence is that it becomes groupthink, and so it reduces to the common denominator. When it operates like that, it's definitely not us operating at our highest level, but when it's able to expose understandings that none of us could have reached on our own, then it is, and there are plenty of examples where we've seen that second case. Well, you have a number of aspects here. You have a knowledge base. You have collective intelligence in the sense that everyone has access to the same information, and those, so they're more informed when they make their decisions. But as far as questions like, what are the core values that they use to make their decisions, does collective intelligence contribute anything to that? 
I think it can if the, uh, if the analysis is really focused on values. We tend to think of it collective intelligence in two forms. One is tacit and one is explicit. And the tacit forms of collective intelligence are really where the serendipity lives. That's where you make discoveries that you couldn't anticipate. And I'll give you an example. People take photographs every day of blue jays, and they post them to Flickr. You can actually go to Flickr and look at the map of the world over time and see the migration pattern of blue jays, not from the studies of biologists or anthologists, but from ordinary people who were simply taking photographs of blue jays because they loved them, but they happened to be taking photographs of blue jays where they were at a particular point in time. So we were able to, we're able as a, as a species to understand the migration patterns of those birds in a different way than maybe we might have we've gone at it as science. So does this mean that if we pool all of our knowledge, we'll get a better overview that you couldn't see from one specific vantage point? You'll be able to see bigger patterns if everyone that's the, contributes that's definitely a, a process. Piece of it. That's, that's the promise of this. And, and it's a promise that we're especially seeing when you look at the um, overlaying of geolocation information with all kinds of data, whether it be economic data or photographic data like Flickr or, or even Wikipedia entries or, or uh, Google, you know, uh, other sorts of things you might find on Google or even YouTube videos, um, you, know, you, can, you can mine that for some very interesting kind of results. Now, there's another kind of collective intelligence, and it's really more the, the area that the NMC operates in, which is the explicit form of collective intelligence. And explicit collective intelligence is intelligence that's, that's made to happen. Wikipedia is the most famous example. So there are lots and lots of people that contribute to Wikipedia. And what Wikipedia is, is has, well, it's become the default encyclopedia for the world, really, um, based on the contributions of tens of thousands of people who are vetting the information, correcting the information, reviewing the information, and so forth. The NMC operates in that way. What we try and do is we try and help our community to discover the things that we care about, to vet that information, to correct it, to, to make it be as good as it can be so that we're proactively and explicitly, which is why we call it explicit collective knowledge, trying to make something understood uh, in a way that none of us could do alone, but collectively we can do very, very well. What sort of things do you think uh, collective intelligence could solve in the long term? Some people view it as almost revolutionary. Do you see it as that big a thing? Or? Well, I think it certainly could be if we applied it to uh, global issues, um, such as you know global warming. We're doing a project with high schools right now where I think that you could... Uh, extend this if it's scaled up. We're doing a, a pilot project, but if you could imagine it, it's scaled up. We're asking kids to imagine, uh, actually not just imagine, but actually develop projects and execute them in schools where they're looking at what they can do to solve a global issue themselves personally. It's what John Lennon referred to as, as you know, think globally, act locally. And it's an expression of that. And if we could apply collective intelligence in an explicit way where we targeted specific problems and really put together all of our understandings, well, what could each of us do individually? I think we really could do something significant. Well, right now the U.S. economy isn't doing very well. There are a lot of seemingly smart people trying to solve it. Uh, are they not being collectively intelligent, or does collective intelligence add something to what they're already trying well, to do? Well, collective intelligence implies that either um, we're finding the serendipity in all of the divergence of opinion, because you don't need to have a collective shared opinion to have collective intelligence. In fact, where the information um, comes up against each other is as interesting as when it's not. Um, but... What we haven't really mined in trying to address the economic issues is what can everybody else do that hasn't, you know, got a graduate degree in economics from an Ivy League school? What, you know, what can, what can the car dealer do? What can the person that runs a pharmacy do? What can the person that's running a small business do? All of us really have a role to play in establishing a solution to a problem that at its core is a problem about um, a shared trust and shared understanding. 